Hey guys, welcome back. It is time once again for yet another deer prep video. Now today I've got the big bad wolf out here. That's right, the Browning A-Bolt 300 Winchester Magnum. Now I don't dig this one out very often because it's kind of expensive to shoot, but I've got a really good occasion to shoot this one this year, and I'll tell you about that in just a little while. But first, let me throw a couple rounds down range to make sure that it's still good. Obviously, this isn't the most stable shooting platform here, but it's about the best I can do. My range actually slopes downhill a little bit, and even if I put these bipod legs out all the way, I don't get the height that I need to shoot comfortably at my target. But let's see how we did. I know it's not perfect, but I've been pretty much able to call all the shots that I made. Okay, so this is what we got. This is not perfect, but this is about as good as you can expect really right now. We're dealing with a lot of heat mirage. It's still very hot out here. We've got basically what appears to be two shot groups. Now I haven't made any adjustments to the scope at all, so this is due to a variation in my form. Most likely my trigger control. I'm used to much cheaper, uh, lower quality rifles. <laughs> And then moving over to this, a very high quality rifle with a very, very good trigger. Uh, it's going to be easier to jerk the trigger when it's that light. And if you jerk the trigger and you're a right-handed shooter, you're going to throw your shots off to the right. So that's probably where this shot group here came from. Now, a factory rifle with factory ammo, you can expect reasonably about a one and a half inch group. That's exactly what we have right here. Here we've got just a little bit larger, it's a two inch group three shots not too bad of course these two are the money shots here and then we got this one flyer I was able to call that one as soon as I pressed the trigger I knew I was gonna th throw that one high and left so dealing with the heat mirage and in addition you saw the rest that I was using there every time you'd shoot uh, the bipod was coming off of that log that's not ideal if you have to reset after every shot you're gonna have variations in your shot group so this gives us a great spot to work with. Our extreme spread is still only about three and a half inches. So I would venture to say that this is probably still zeroed in. Uh, it's just my shooting form right now with that rest is not great. <laughs> but as it gets closer to the season and it cools down a little bit, uh, we're going to work with this and get it down to, at the very least, a one and a half inch group zeroed in right where we need to be. Oh. And I can already feel that in the old shoulder. <laughs> so you might be wondering why I'm pulling out the big guns when I've already zeroed in a couple other rifles this year. Well the reason why is because I've been drawn on a very special quota hunt down in the state of Georgia. And it's in an area that's very difficult to get access to. It's called Chattahoochee Fall Line WMA. And that's a spot that just opened to the public a few years ago. Prior to it being open to the public, uh, it was privately owned and it was intensively trophy managed. So there's a lot of big bucks out there for the guy who's skilled enough and lucky enough to get one. So I'm not leaving anything to chance. I'm taking my nicest stuff out there. I'm taking my Sunday best. <laughs> the hunt itself is only three days long. They only have two quota hunts out there per year, so you can imagine how coveted of an area this is. Now it's all fair chase, it's all public land, but this is going to be one of the few times that you see old Wiggy actually looking for some antlers on top of his deer. Every other time I'm just trying to fill the freezer, but this has got sort of a, maybe not exactly, but sort of a once in a lifetime affair. Uh, it's not very often that an opportunity like this comes around. So anyways, I was very lucky to get access to the spot. I've got a friend down there that I used to work with. I'm going to meet up with him. We're going to be camping out. It's not going to be the type of camping that I normally do because this is going to be at a public campground. So there's going to be a lot of other people around there. Uh, but it should still be very fun. And hopefully we get to bring home some bacon 
and some antlers. <laughs> All right, stay tuned. And I'm making my way to my trail camera out here. I'm going to pull the memory card. It's been out here for probably uh, well, about three weeks now. So we're going to see if we got anything good on there. Now the last good thing that I got I showed on my previous video, the uh, Jaguar crossbow follow-up. We got a nice eight-point buck on video and a little bit smaller buck too that I'd be happy with during bow season, I think. Uh, anyways, here we are. That. All right, we got it. Let's see if we got any good video. All right, so it's been a pretty good day so far. Did good with the rifle. Checked out my hunting spots, they're all doing good. So I think it's time to hit up the gym. Now, I don't take much footage in there. That's because a lot of times there's other people in there. And it's very impolite to whoop out a camera if you're in the workout room. You know, people don't want to be on film. <laughs> Not when they're getting their, uh, getting their workout on, you know. So, maybe I'll get some footage if it's just me in there. But I kind of think it won't be. But we'll see. Alright. Looks like 150 pounds looks good to start with. That was a pretty good workout. <laughs> a little bit over an hour. You guys know that I just started working out here at the gym at the beginning of the summer. And I've seen some really big improvements since then. You know, whenever I first started working out here, I was struggling to get through a 10 or 15 minute long workout. And now, you know, I'm getting in a little bit over an hour and still feeling really good. It seems like every time I come here, I'm improving in some way. That's what it's all about. You know, it's not about making some kind of arbitrary goals, you know, like you, you got to make a 10 minute mile 
or you got to lift twice your body weight. It's about persistence and just coming here and uh, sticking with it, you know. <laughs> That's where your gains are going to come from, is just the persistence. So anyways, guys, stay tuned. All right, so I reviewed the footage from the trail camera, and I didn't get a whole lot, but what I did get is solid gold. Check this out. Man, would you look at that. <laughs> Old Biggins McAntler is there right in the middle. He appears to be a nine-point buck. On the side closest to the camera, you can see he's got at least five points. On his opposite side, it's a little bit more difficult to tell uh, because of the video quality, but he looks like he's got four points on that side. Now, I'm going to guess his age to be probably somewhere around three and a half to four and a half years old. He might be older than that, but a lot of times the older bucks won't hang out in bachelor groups. They become more loners. Uh, the buck on the right of the camera appears to be a decent eight-point buck, and the buck on the left is kind of hard to tell, uh, but he's the smallest one out of the group. <laughs> but this is the stuff that hunting, hunting season dreams are made out of. You know, whenever you're not seeing anything for days on end, you remember stuff like that and remember that there's big monster bucks out there. That keeps you motivated. Now, I went ahead and pulled the trail camera here because after I put the memory card back in, as you see, our light lights up but the display doesn't come up so I think we're getting low on batteries I'm gonna take it back to the house and uh, slap some fresh batteries in here and see what happens in the meantime I put the memory card back in the other camera too so we'll still have some footage before deer season opens stay tuned alright so one of the questions I get asked probably more than any other is how do you sharpen your knives well that's a difficult question to answer <laughs> because not all knife steels are the same different types of knife steels lend themselves well to different types of sharpening also you have to worry about what type of uh, what type of bevel you want on here what type of an edge uh, for a bushcrafting knife you may want something like a convex edge for something like a fillet knife you may want something more like a flat edge on there or a saber grind or whatever you know and you've got really hard steels like you know, buck knives have a fairly hard steel this 110 folder here this is an older one it's a very hard steel that's going to be very difficult to sharpen on a handstone whereas something like this Victorinox here or even the Mora with their Sandvik steel it's a little bit softer uh, that tends to work really well with hand sharpening but I'm going to show you guys the methods that I use and there's a few of them <laughs> to get the edge that I want on my knives. Alright the first sharpening method that I'm going to go over is sharpening with a hand stone or sharpening by hand. Uh, this particular one is a diamond stone. Uh, this is the size that you would keep like in your house or in your shop. If you got to sharpen on the go I use something like this. This little uh, diamond rod. There you go. You've got a flat edge there and you've got a rounded edge on the other side with a little groove in there. That groove is for sharpening fish hooks. Now this is easy to carry around with you, just like so. It's about the size of a pen. It's even got the little pocket clip there like a pen does. You've got your natural Arkansas stones here. This is a medium fine grit stone. And then here I have a very fine uh, razor honing stone. This was made originally for sharpening straight razors. And you want some type of strop, a piece of leather. Uh, that's going to come in at the end to get all your burrs off of the edge. Now for any type of stone that you use, you're going to want to lubricate it with something. Usually I, I use a type of oil. This is a honing oil right here. This keeps uh, the little shavings that you're taking off with the stone from actually getting impregnated down into the stone. So just to show how this works, basically I'm going to start out with sort of little circular motions here just to get that oil spread around. Any type of lubricant is better than no lubricant at all. Uh, you can use water, you can use oil, you can use both water and oil. Um, for most of your natural Arkansas stones, it doesn't matter. 
Now for the man-made stones, sometimes it's best to stick with whatever the manufacturer says. <laughs> but in general, uh, anything's better than nothing. Okay, now we've got this oil spread out here. What you want to do is get your edge down on the stone and act like you're cutting into it. Right? You'll feel whenever that edge is down on that stone, because it'll feel like you're cutting the top of the stone. They often say, pretend like you're slicing a thin piece of cheese off the top of the stone. Now the angle that you hold your edge at is very important. Very important. That's where all of your success is going to come from when you're sharpening by hand is keeping a consistent angle. Now for my outdoor knives like my camping knives and bushcraft knives I stick with about a 25 degree angle. For my hunting and fishing knives I go down to about a 20 degree angle. I'm not going to spend all day on this because i got a lot of material to cover. <laughs> I normally start out with a diamond stone because they tend to be fairly uh, coarse. Now we're going to move to the medium fine and we're going to do the exact same thing. Okay. Now the harder steels are just incredibly difficult to sharpen by hand. Now you can do it, but it just requires a lot more skill and more time. Obviously they're harder. The stone just isn't going to do as much work. Alright. So, here we go. We've done some on that. Check my edge here. Feels very good. Alright, now moving on to the fine razor honing stone. Same thing. Now to finish all this off, you would use your piece of leather. Now, before we were pushing in with the blade, right? Like you're cutting into it. You don't want to do that with your piece of leather here. You want to go away. And what this does is it's going to take those fine little burrs off of your edge and kind of polish everything up. So whenever you get done, you get a very nice very sharp edge. <laughs> All right, so that's how you use the hand stones. And again, softer steels are going to work a lot better with this. Let's move on. All right, the next thing that I want to talk about is these sharpening kits. This particular one is made by Smiths. This is my favorite. Now, for sharpening my hunting knives and sometimes my fishing knives, this is what I go with. You typically have something like a little vise to put your blade in. There you go. Tighten that back down. Now, on this particular model, you have your choice between uh, 20, 25, 30, or 35 degrees on your angle there. All right, and then you've got your stones here. Stick that in there. Okay, and they give you some honing oil. Now, the way that these work is you're going to use this just like a vise. You've got a little tiny notch right here that the blade is going to fit into. Sometimes you got to let it find its happy place here, and you tighten everything down. You got these two knobs here to tighten it with. Okay, that's good and solid. Now, squirt a little bit of honing oil on your stone. It doesn't take much. And pick which one you want to use. I'm going to go 25 degrees because that's what I was doing with this before. You start out with little circular motions right here. On the other side, now, as you can tell, this is going to give you a nearly perfect edge bevel here. 
So when you want 25 degrees, you're going to get 25 degrees. This is also going to make it a flat grind. That may not be the <laughs> right choice of words there. A full flat grind is something a little bit different. But instead of your edge being rolled inwards a little bit, it's going to be flat because you're keeping it pretty much perfectly consistent. Some people call it a saber grind, some people call it all kinds of different things. But your edge is going to be flat. And this works a whole lot faster than sharpening by hand. These kits aren't amazingly expensive either. Just do the same number on each side. Now these come with, uh, I'm using the fine stone here. You also have a coarse, this is a diamond stone, and you have, this one I don't use very often, <laughs> this one is shaped like a V, that is for sharpening a serrated edge. Serrated edges are very difficult to sharpen uh, by hand. But there you go. The Smiths is my favorite, but there are others. I'll show you some different types of them. They, they sell all different types of kits. Some have natural stones. I'll show you one here. This one is the diamond stone kit. It's got these larger diamond stones. And you've got fine, coarse, and again a serrated stone. Same thing on this one. It's a little bit more dumbed down. You've only got a 20 or 25 degree angle that you can use here. Here's an older one. It's an older version of the same thing. <laughs> but these are real easy to use, very user friendly, and they just work a whole lot more consistently and faster than your hand stones will. And you can even do things like reprofile your edge, although it's going to take you a long time. Um, yeah, that's really, really sharp. <laughs> uh, again, not too expensive. There's different types of them out there. Some are more expensive than others. If you're going to pick just one, I would pick that. I would pick the Smiths. Now, there's different brands. There's a Lansky. People told me, oh, Lansky's better. you got to get a Lansky. I'm actually missing some parts out of this one. This originally had five different stones in here. This was a lot more expensive than the, <laughs> the Smith's kit, uh, but it comes with basically the same stuff. The stones go together a little bit differently. If I can get this out. There we go. These push through like that, and then you tighten the screw on the stone. Now the benefit to the Lansky is on the back here you might be able to see you've got some different angles that you can choose from. You can do 17, 20, 25, or 30. So you can get a lot more fine with the Lansky. But using this, it's just a little bit more fiddly to me. I tend to go faster with the Smith's sharpening kits. Uh, and again, this, this did have more stones in here. So you had a choice of really what to go with. I think this one is the medium. Yeah, you have like fine and extra fine, and you can get different stones for it. But any of those are going to be good. Uh, as I said, I prefer the Smiths. All right, the last thing that we're going to talk about is this. This is the WorkSharp knife sharpener. It's a powered unit, as you can tell. <laughs> this has some advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is it doesn't use stones. You've got this belt here, just like a belt sander. Uh, so you don't have to use any oil on this. Uh, but that's also kind of a disadvantage too because these belts are going to wear out and you have to buy more. Not a huge deal. They're not amazingly expensive. You get a couple of them with the kit. Now you've got some coarse ones. You can get really coarse ones. You can get really, really fine ones. And you can get exactly what you want out of this. Now this will give you 
a convex grind. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit more round, whereas the Smith sharpener, it's going to be flat. Uh, this is going to give you an edge that's closer to uh, what you would have sharpening by hand. Because unless you're just like a master sharpener with a hand stone, uh, despite your best efforts, it's going to come out a little bit convex just because your hand isn't that consistent. You're going to roll it just a little bit. Uh, but this is always going to be kind of convex just because of the way the knife blade has to push down onto the belt and the belt rolls around it. So you get that little rounded edge there. Now, that's good for some applications. A lot of bushcrafters love a convex edge. If you work with a lot of wood, it's a stronger edge to work with. So that's pretty cool. If you've got a lot of knives, I can highly recommend using one of these. I used to spend a ton of time sharpening all my knives, especially my fillet knives. I'd go fishing, you know, cleaning catfish <laughs> and other fish like that. You know, you were going to dull these knives very quickly. So I would go through three or four of them and then spend, you know, an hour or two sharpening all these back up razor sharp. Now I can just pull out something like this and in just a few minutes. just a little bit of practice because it does take a little bit of practice that is just hair popping sharp now so it's a huge time saver also if you have a big job to do like we did on this the US Air Force pilot survival knife we had to reprofile that edge you see how much metal we took off there and I used this exclusively for this uh, because it's, it just would have taken way too long with any other type of sharpening method and we got a very fine edge on there as I showed in the video where we worked on this so reprofiling edges yeah you can do it with the Smiths but this is going to be a whole lot faster so again I use this for things like uh, well anything that's just going to take too long with any other method uh, here's a good example my top's anaconda. Sure, I can sharpen that with any method. It's got really good steel. But I usually sharpen it on here just because we've got such a long edge. Uh, just saves so much time. <laughs> and you get about the same result. Plus, for the top's anaconda, I'm going to do a lot of chopping with it, batoning, things like that. That convex edge is really going to help because you get that extra amount of strength from the shape of the edge. Alright guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, a lot of people get all tore up when you start talking about sharpening kits, like the Smith's kits, and especially these uh, powered units here. Uh, all they want to use is a sharpening stone, and they say that's all you should need, and all the rest of this is a waste of money. But like I said before, different types of knives, different types of knife steels, uh, lend themselves well to different types of sharpening. Now, here's a little story from my past as an example. I used to be a little bit of a knife snob. <laughs> In fact, I thought that buck knives were just about the worst knives that you could get. Because at the time, they used a very, very hard steel like this one here. They use a little bit softer steel now. But sharpening by hand, uh, I just didn't get the quality of edge that I thought that I should get. And one day I was out hunting, and I met another hunter, and he pulled his buck knife out. It was the same thing. Uh, the folder here and he said well test the edge on that and that thing was like surgically sharp <laughs> I said how in the world did you get your knife that sharp I've never seen a buck knife that was that sharp and he said you got to use one of these Smith's sharpening kits and I went out and bought one of these and immediately I became less of a knife snob because it turns out that a really hard steel is just really hard to sharpen with a hand stone if you use something that's more consistent, you get a lot better of an edge. So, uh, overnight, it just opened up a whole new world. Now, if you want to get the most out of your knife, no matter what type of knife it is, you may have to go with something like a sharpening kit or one of these uh, powered, you know, work sharp knife sharpeners. Here's a really good example. Everybody likes to talk smack about Bud K. Well, this is one that I got <laughs> in one of my unboxing videos. This is the uh, Timber Rattler El Paso Bowie. And uh, 
or as I like to call it, the El Cheapo Bowie. <laughs> and this is just, look, it just says stainless steel. Who knows what type of steel it is, but I used the work sharp knife sharpener here. I reprofiled the edge, and even with something as, as bad as this, I mean, this thing probably costs, what, $20, $25? It's, uh, it's just amazing, you know, what you can do. So, yeah, this is definitely... Whoop, messed up a little bit there. There we go. See, this is definitely really, really sharp now. Now, who knows how well it's going to hold that edge? Probably not very well. Uh, but if you want to get the most out of your knives... Like I said, you may have to use something other than a handstone, because I kind of doubt that anybody other than, say, a master hand sharpener, <laughs> if there is such a thing, uh, could get a knife like this with very poor quality, questionable steel this sharp. So anyways, guys, that is all the time that I have for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's been a fun video to make. You know, we got to do a little bit of shooting, we did some working out, we saw a giant buck on the video, and we talked about knife sharpening <laughs> and a hunt that hopefully I'll get to go on uh, later on this year. So anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, thumbs up. It never gets old. That never gets old. <laughs> By the way, I was talking about uh, buck knives. It's just kind of a postscript on the video here. Buck knives are now my favorite hunting knife. As you see, I've got the the 110 folder here. What else do I have? Oh, this is the buck diamondback. There you go. This little thing here. Very, very lightweight. Unfortunately, this one's made in China. I've got, oh, which, is this the, uh, the 105? Yeah, the Buck 105. This is one of my oldest knives. They don't even make this style of sheath anymore, but I love that. There we go. What else do we got? Oh, look at this. We got the 119. You guys have seen this in other videos, too. Pretty much all of these I use the uh, Smith Sharpeners on, by the way. Well, here's an interesting one. You guys haven't seen this one before. This is the Buck 119 Brahma. Reminds you a little bit of a K-Bar. <laughs> there you go. It's got that leather stacked handle. And all of these are exceptional quality. These two are basically twins. These are both uh, 119s. And this one for, you know, anybody interested in such a thing, you've got these holes here so that you can make a spear out of this. You've got one hole on the back there, too. One thing I don't like about this design, you see that one pin. One pin right there. It's asymmetrical. Shouldn't there be another pin on the other side? Yeah, this piece is threaded on here. It is full tang, uh, or at least a full stick tang. It does come out to this bottom piece, and this is threaded on, and then... It's pinned in place to keep it from unthreading. <laughs> kind of a weird design for buck. <laughs> but anyways, all these are great. I got buck knives on top of buck knives. But uh, like I said, they're my favorite. <laughs> so there you go. All right, video is really over now. Thanks.